May I draw your attention to the most stark, the most dramatic, the most significant passage of all literature in all millenniums. Turn with me please to Mark, the 15th chapter. The astonishing thing about the record of the cross is that people who loved Christ more than life could write it without emotion. You'll never find them saying, Wonder, O heavens, be astonished, O earth. Look at these terrible people and what they're doing to the most wonderful man that ever lived. There's none of that. It's just as though we're picked up, carried over there to Palestine, to outside the city, and there we see for ourselves what happened. It is stark indeed. Let's notice from verse 22 of Mark 15. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. And they offered him wine mingled with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them casting lots for them to decide which each should take. It was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. With him they crucified two robbers, one on his right, one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Ha ha, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross. So also the chief priests mocked him to one another with the scribes saying, He saved others. He can't save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. And those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he's calling Elijah. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar, put on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let's see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Jesus uttered a loud cry breathed his last and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and when the centurion who stood facing him saw that he thus breathed his last he said truly this man was the son of God the passage is perfectly calm it's reverently reticent the repetition of the word and or and they has the effect of waves beating, beating waves of pain and agony and evil beating upon the sufferer of the cross. This event is the most significant event of all the happenings of history. In all the cascade of events, this one. But the paradox is it's the event that had the least likelihood of being influential for good. For whoever died on a cross was a curse. It was a death of dishonour. The Romans in their early years, centuries, refused to use it. Only when they became brutalised by conquest did they adopt this practice are the more barbarous nations. But even then with distinction, even the meanest Roman, whatever he had done, could not be crucified. Everybody knew this death was a curse. This death meant dishonour. The Jews planned it, of course. The Jews planned it because they said, this will finish him. His sun will set in obscurity. The cross will show that he's disowned by Abraham. He's rejected by Moses. 
For it said in the books of the Old Testament, whoever hangs on a tree is accursed. But instead, the cross is suddenly transfigured. It's irradiated. It's glorified. It becomes a magnet attracting the hearts of millions in all ages. Now the cross didn't do it to Jesus. Jesus did it to the cross. Despite the death, because of him who hung on it, it became an object of glory and wonder. And now the shadow of the cross is like the shadow of the sun. It brings light and life. When they laid the cross on the ground before they impaled our Lord on it, it pointed north, south, east and west. When they raised it upright with him upon it, it joined heaven and earth and east and west. Everything in the providence of God was to show its universality. It's not under the roof of the temple. It's under the open heavens. When his blood drops fall to the earth, they cleanse the world. It's not in the city because the city is now under a curse. It's outside the city in the open air think of all the implications of the symbolism north, south, east, west heaven, earth embracing all cultures and then think of the lettering on the cross the lettering of the Greeks the culture of the world the lettering of the Romans the government of the world the lettering of the Jews the religion that was most significant in the world Here's a universal phenomenon marked out in the providence of God by these hieroglyphics. Many things help us to elucidate the mystery. Just to remind you of one. In the event of the transfiguration, he discusses his coming decease, it says. The Greek word is exodus, but it means death. His coming death, his exodus from this world by the cross. He discusses it with Moses and Elijah and they agree with him that this and this alone can fulfill the law and the prophets because Moses represents the law and Elijah represents the prophets. And then heaven adds its ratification Christ is transfigured in glory. So here the cross is irradiated ahead of time and God is telling us that when this event happens it will fulfill all that was found in the writings of Moses and all that was found in the prophets. Here would be law and love personified hanging on the tree. Here would be our substitute. Here would be the Adam asleep on the sixth day and his side opened that he might have a bride. Here would be Abel, the good shepherd, murdered because he's righteous. Here would be Noah who saved his house by a building made from wood. Here would be Joseph who when the world was famishing would give it the bread of life. Here would be Moses who'd leave the ivory palaces of heaven to redeem a world of slaves. Here would be Joshua who'd lead them into the promised land because Moses in a sense stood for the law and the law can never take you through. But Joshua is the same name as Jesus. It's just a Hebrew form. Here's the true Solomon. Here's the true Jonah. Here's the true temple. He's the fulfillment of law and prophets. It's Christ who irradiated the cross, not the cross who irradiated him. I want you to think briefly on those fragments of speech from the cross. We've talked before at length on the seven sayings and I'm not going to do that. But I just want to point out to you the marvellous symmetry of the sayings. Wherever you have seven of anything in the Bible, it's always divided into a four and a three. A three and a four or a four and a three. The first time is at creation. Where God makes the material fabric and then he peoples it in the, in the next three and seals it with the Sabbath. First four, the material creation. Then the last three are separate. Whenever you've got seven, four and three or three and four. Now on the cross, there are two sets of sayings. Three and four. The first three are directed to humanity in connection with this world. The last four are directed to deity and the next world. The first three are universal. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do here he speaks of a sinful world including us 
we were in that prayer. We crucified our Lord. So in the first saying from the cross, it's a universal saying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Here's the most beautiful blossom of all the teaching of Christ. He loves his enemies. He loves those who crucify him. Here he exemplifies his own victim from the cross. That God is kind to the selfish and the ungrateful. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They still need forgiveness. Ignorance is no excuse because truth is available. People neglect the means of getting the truth. It's there. They need forgiveness. He prays it. Why doesn't he grant it? Because now he's the prisoner of the bar. He's no longer king and judge. On earth before the cross, he granted forgiveness. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. He doesn't do that now. He prays for God to forgive because now he's a sufferer. He's no longer in the position of the great judge. Father, forgive them. There's the universal plea telling us how God looks down upon the world. That's how God thinks as he looks upon the world with mercy and with love. Moving from the universal to the particular, the next statement has to do with the repentant sinners. The first to the ignorant sinners, the whole world. The second statement to the repentant sinner. You see, when the Pharisees put Christ in the middle between the thieves, they want to attribute guilt by association. Indicate he was what they were. But what happened when he stood between the two thieves, his presence evoked the real nature in potential of each man. Christ becomes a savior of death under death or life under life according to what's in us and whether we will respond to the moving of the spirit. So the presence of Christ evokes what's in each man and one man curses him. They both began by cursing him. But the second man as he watches and as he reads the little Bible over the head of Christ, Jesus, Saviour, Joshua, King, He's convinced. So the first saying from the cross, a universal benediction and prayer of intercession. The second one, a particular one for the penitent. The third saying, for his own. See the shift? First, the whole world of guilty, ignorant sinners. Secondly, the penitent sinners. Thirdly, the believers. He sees his mother, who is the symbol of the church. He sees John. Woman, behold thy son. John, John, behold thy mother. So see the beautiful structure of these sayings from the cross. The universal, the particular, first the sinners, then the saints. Then the next four move from this world and move from humanity and have to do with his relationship to God and the world to come. My God, my God, why have you? And the answer of course is so that God wouldn't forsake us. That's why. He forsook Christ so you and I might know we're never forsaken. However black the night, however long the night, and some nights are an eternity. He can't forsake us because he forsook his son. So he can't forsake us. He forsook his son so he could never forsake us. And then he gives the cry that was Samson's when the victory was accomplished. When Samson slew the enemies of Israel, he said, I thirst. And Christ gives the same cry to symbolise to heaven that the work given him has been accomplished. He's slain the world, the flesh and the devil. He's the overcomer. He's the victor. The Sabbath is drawing nigh. In the city behind him, they are preparing for the sacred day. Parents are beginning to read to the children from Genesis 2, 1 to 3. In the temple they are saying the, the special Sabbath prayer which uses the words about on the sixth day God finished his work. And he rests on the seventh day because in it he had rested from the work which he would finished and made. And as the word finish is being echoed in the city Christ suddenly calls out it is finished. He tells heaven there's a new creation that's been made afresh. And the Sabbath will now be the sign of the new creation as well as the old, of redemption as well as of creation. And then he gives the child's good night prayer. Father, into thy hands I commend my life. We model many prayers and that's still, if I should die before I wake, you know, we still do it. He gives the good child's good night prayer. 
So there's the beautiful structure of those sayings. I'm not going into details because we've had meetings on them before. Now I want to look at the picture of the cross from an angle that's somewhat different. And I have to confess that while I've thought about the elements of this for many, many years, it's only come together for me in the last 24 hours, including a running to the library about 3 o'clock in the morning, this morning. But as I went for a walk yesterday after the meetings, I thought, inside the veil and outside the city. You know those sayings? Let's look at the second one. Turn to Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13. We're talking about inside the veil and outside the city. And we're going to start with the second one. Please notice in Hebrews 13. It says in verse 11, the body of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. The camp means the city. The camp is an allusion to when they were pilgrims in the wilderness and they had a camp around the tabernacle. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate, outside the city was Golgotha, in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing abuse for him, outside the camp, outside the gate outside the city let us go forth to him he went outside the camp he went outside the gate he went outside the city let's do the same thing he was rejected if you stand for truth you will be the devil will reject you the world will reject you sometimes the church will reject you but let us go forth under him that's where he is that's where he is he's not in the place of apostasy that's crucifying him He's not in the place where religions run to sea. Let's go forth to him. He's outside the camp. You have to have courage to be a Christian. They burnt early Christians. They dipped them in bitumen and made them the lights of Nero's beer gardens. They put the skins of animals on them and then let lions and tigers run at them. It takes courage to be a Christian. Let's go forth under him, outside the gate. Do you know what was outside the gate in the camp of Israel? And outside the gate of Jerusalem, that's where the lepers were. Turn back to Leviticus chapter 5, if you would. Leviticus chapter 5. Have I given you a wrong reference? I'll try and check it later. Early in Leviticus it talks about the, the lepers being put outside the camp. I've missed the reference. We'll find it again another time. Take my word for it for the moment. <laughs> the lepers were put outside the camp. And the rubbish was put outside the camp. And the burnt bodies of the sacrifices were put outside the camp and malefactors when they were crucified were thrown outside the camp what company what company if you're going to go outside the camp some will think of you as a leper you don't want to associate with a leper that's dangerous don't associate with a leper don't do that who wants to be thought of as garbage? Who wants to be reckoned a malefactor? Benefactor, that's fine, not a malefactor. So when Paul tells us, or whoever wrote Hebrews, let's go outside the camp, my, what he's really saying? What he's really saying? That's what it means to be a Christian. Now I want you to think on something. The heavenly camp, Jesus left and went outside the camp. You know in Revelation 20, it calls the holy city the camp of the saints. And long, long ago, 
our Lord Jesus left the camp and went outside the camp to this world. When he died, because the city which had been the holy city is now unholy, because the temple is now forsaken, your house is left under you desolate, Christ goes outside the camp. The altar is now out in the world where the Gentiles are. Now I want you to put with this passage the other one, inside the veil. Please come with me to Hebrews 10 and 19, would you? Hebrews 10 and 19. The New Testament has many parallel books to the old. Revelations are parallel to Daniel and Hebrews is the parallel to Leviticus. And I want you to notice these words of interpretation about everything that happened in connection with the cross. Verse 19, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place, that's the correct translation and the, uh, any, the New International, I think, gives that, enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way which is opened for us through the curtain, Within the veil, give some translation. Inside the veil. Go inside. Go beyond the second curtain. Go inside into the most holy place. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, our bodies washed with pure water. Please notice what it's saying. Brethren, have confidence. Come inside the veil, the second veil, into the most holy place with assurance. Come back and look at the last verse of Hebrews 6. Would you do that, please? By the way, the reference I was looking for before was Numbers 5, not Leviticus 5. I've been doing some juggling while I've been talking. It's Numbers 5. Here it is. I'll give it to you right now. Command the people of Israel they put out of the camp every leper and everyone having a discharge and everyone that's unclean through contact with the dead. Put them both, male and female, put them outside the camp. That was a reference, not Leviticus, Numbers. Back to Hebrews 6. Verse 18, through two unchangeable things in which it's impossible that God should prove false we who fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to seize the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anger of the soul, a hope that enters within the veil, inside the veil. Some give into the inner shrine, within the curtain, where Jesus has gone. I want you to think on what this is talking about. Only once a year did anyone go there. You see, the old religion was a religion of distance. My memory told me that there was a mile distance between the tents of the Israelites and the most holy place and the holy place, between the courtyard and the holy places. A mile distance. When someone was guilty, the thousands of Israel saw the guilty one make the long pilgrimage. You couldn't hide. You couldn't make a 10 second dash. You walked over a mile, 2,000 cubits, to bring your offering. Inside the courtyard, the Levites could move. Inside the first apartment, the ordinary priest could move. But the second apartment where God was, the Shekinah glory, that was a place just for the high priest, just once a year, only with blood, plus incense, for a few moments. A religion of distance. In the days of Christ, there was a court of the Gentiles came to a certain place. Then a court of the women came a little closer to the temple. Then a court of the men. And then the Levites, then the priests, then the high priest once a year. Now what Hebrews is saying is all that barrier's down. That barrier is a symbol of sin and sin's been dealt with. 
All the barriers between man and God, humanity and God, men and women, boys and girls, all the things that block us out of his presence has been dealt with. Your past, your failures, your mistakes, your present shortcomings. It's all been dealt with. Come boldly. Come boldly inside the curtain with our high priest. He took us in there. We went in with him. If one died for all, all died. We were in our high priest when he died on the cross. That's the wonderful meaning of 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14. If one died for all, then all died. That's the glorious gospel in a nutshell. That when Christ hung on the cross, God saw the whole world in him. We were ruined by the first Adam. We had nothing to do with that. We were redeemed by the second Adam. We had nothing to do with that. And so come inside the veil. Come into the presence of God. You know, in the crucifixion record, it talks about the rending of the veil. Look, please, at Matthew again, the story of the cross, Matthew 27. In this record... In verse 51 it says, Behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to the bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split and the tombs were opened. The last words before all that says he yielded up his life, yielded up his spirit, his breath, he breathed out, he expired. As that great heart broke under the weight of the sins of the world, the earth shook, the rocks were rent, tombs were opened. And the veil was rent, not from bottom to top, as men would have done it, but from the top to the bottom. And it wasn't rent in a little corner. It was rent in the middle. It says in the midst. And it was a thorough job. It wasn't just rolled up so someone could roll it down again later. It's done for. It meant the abolition of the old system of Judaism. Not of everything in it you destroy an old house you never destroy the light that's in it there was much light in Judaism but it meant the destruction of all the types and symbols shadow of a tree stops when it reaches the trunk so no longer do we need offerings no longer do we need to come to Jerusalem no longer need we practice circumcision as a, as a religious ceremony and so the cross is torn the veil is torn as the earth rocks as the heart of Christ is torn that we might know that every barrier between us and God is gone that's the good news every barrier between us and God is gone notice in Hebrews 10 that verse we were first reading in Hebrews there's a very significant statement a little bit earlier, would you come back in that chapter please and let's look at something there. How is it that Paul or whoever wrote Hebrews can make this statement about come boldly inside the veil, join your high priest? How can he do that? Verse 14 of the same chapter 10, by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified by a single offering he has perfected for all time the word sanctified here means set apart those whom he's set apart if you're called you're sanctified you're set apart by a single offering he perfected us it doesn't mean he's perfected me inside I fight me every day and every conscious hour and sometimes in my dreams I'm still doing it it doesn't mean that now sin is no longer a temptation. It doesn't mean the heart doesn't quiver. It doesn't mean the feet aren't tempted to go the wrong way. It doesn't mean that. It means despite what I am, I am accepted in the beloved. I am complete in him. I have entered inside the veil. And my friends, when we enter inside the veil where the Shekinah is, you remember that light looked down at the law in the ark through the bloodstained mercy seat. When the high priest came in on the day of famine, he sprinkled blood on the gold seat that was over the ark that contained the law. So the symbol of God, the great light, the Shekinah, looks at the broken law in the ark through the bloodstained mercy seat. But my friends, when we come in with our high priest, 
because of that blood the law is now written in our hearts but never see the law on its own duty has a twin sister this is a hard lesson to learn we are either natural Pharisees or we're natural Puritans but duty has a twin sister the law had a mercy seat the law of God combined with the mercy of God can break almost any heart but law without mercy hardens the heart this is why we lose so many young people we give them all the standards don't listen to that sort of music don't take drugs don't run around with girls before you're the right age and the right place and the right company and the right intentions we give them all the don'ts we cut off their ears and we harden their hearts because we give them law without love law without mercy my friends what God has joined together let no man put asunder the ark had a mercy seat God himself only looks at the broken law through the mercy seat I'm so glad I need mercy and I need it every day and when we come in with our high priest inside the veil you write that law in our hearts but that law is about mercy that law is about love to God about love to man and one of the commandments that talks about that while God visits the sins of the fathers on the children, the third and fourth generation of those that hate him, when the children copy the parents' attitude of hating, they inherit the, the parents' uh, weaknesses. But then it says, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. There's mercy there in the ten. Their whole message is really love, love to God, love to man. It's only because of my hard heart it's put in negatives. Adam and Eve knew nothing about thou shalt not. When man was made, he naturally loved. It's only when we fell that God had to say thou shalt not because all our passions now ran riot. We don't have any natural inclinations anymore. All the God-given faculties for eating, drinking, sleeping, fa uh, sexing, everything is exaggerated because of the fall. Everything. But despite all of that, when we enter in with our high priest inside the veil, we who've gone outside the camp, he writes that law of love in our hearts and he reminds us of the mercy that combines with it. This is a beautiful message of the gospel, dear friends. And it's a very practical message. I want to close our study by looking at just two other verses in the record of Matthew. Come back to Matthew 27. I want you to notice verse 34. They offered him wine to drink mingled with gall. When he tasted it, he would not drink it. The Jewish people believed in mercy. Many of their laws were very merciful. They were forbidden to fully glean their fields so that the poor could go through and get plenty to eat. They were forbidden to take a man's coat. Doesn't matter how much the man owed the creditor. You cannot take his coat. He sleeps in it by night and he wears it by day. There were laws even dealing with bird's eggs. There are laws about the top of your houses. You have a rampart in case someone fell over. It's a very merciful law. I had a letter the other day saying to me, I can't reconcile the Old Testament with the New. God wiped me out all these nations. Jesus wouldn't have done that. I wrote to them, my dear friend, please read Leviticus 18 and 19 where it says the nations did these terrible things and if you do the same I'll toss you out also the fact is the Canaanites were so depraved they put newborn babies in the foundation of their houses incest was natural to them they were so perverse that in mercy to the world God wiped them out as you'd cut off a gangrenous limb but in the passage that discusses it it says to the Israelites and if you do these things I'll wipe you out too and then it says but when you're harvesting in the field, don't harvest all of it. Leave plenty for people to glean. Here's how you to deal with the poor. Remember, you were a stranger in the land of Egypt, so be kind to the stranger. Oh no, it's the same God, my friend. It's just we don't have enough information behind some of God's mighty acts. But when he wiped out nations that were absolutely depraved, it was a mercy to the world. We do the same with a gangrenous limb today. The Jews had a practice that when someone died on the cross, they'd give them a stupefying potion. That was a merciful thing. I don't believe in pain for pain's sake. I hate 
pain. And it does one good occasionally to sit in the dentist's chair, though he's always the last resort for me. But it does one good occasionally because it brings us down to the pith of life and the marrow of existence and the reality that some people have all the time. But I'm all in favour of the things that will block it. I have been associated with the dying and in years and years ago nurses were very reluctant to give pain-killing drugs sufficient to deal with the pain of a dying person. Their motive was good. If this person gets out, we don't want them addicted. But that motive is dissolved if it's quite sure the patient is terminal. If a patient is terminal, all pain that's possible to eradicate should be eradicated. There's no virtue in suffering pain for pain's sake. So here was a very merciful Jewish custom that Christ might accept it. He must suffer because he must atone. He's not going to blunt his mind. He wants to make a perfect atonement for our sins. So he, and it's not an example for you and me when we desperately need pain medication. It's not an example. We're not atoning. But a saviour of the world, because he's making atonement for the sins of the world, he wouldn't touch it. But there's another reason. Sin began through the wrong use of the appetite. The redeemer of the world will exemplify the opposite. My friends, when you and I become Christians, Christianity spells out discipline. We don't like discipline. I'm a Queenslander. Queensland is about the most undisciplined people in the world. <laughs> Oh, you know, that's, a, that's an Australian telling you. He says he agrees. Footloose and fancy free. Most Queenslanders in many parts of the state, they could shoot a, a gun anywhere, wouldn't do any harm, except to a tree. And they're very free people, see. We don't like discipline by nature. But my friends, when you become a Christian, you must learn discipline. You're no longer free just to be moved by passion and pride. You are no longer free to be controlled by the love of ease. You don't ask what's comfortable, what's easy, what will uh, feed my pride. The question of a converted Christian is, what is God's will for me? And my friends, it means discipline in every area of the life. What I'm talking about now is not popular. There are modern Christian books written to say, hey, once you're converted and you have the gospel, you can live as you're free and you can't be lost. Once saved, always saved. No problem. And that's not the New Testament gospel. It is true that despite a thousand mistakes and errors, if on my knees I'm looking to Jesus, I can't be lost. That's true. But it's not true that the converted heart is careless about the will of his heavenly Father. If we belong to God, dear friends, we become disciplined people. I want to make it very practical. We're in that part of the world where people die because of what they put between their lips. In three quarters of the world, people die because they haven't got enough to put between their lips. Eight out of ten in every hospital is there because of what they put between their lips. Two or three are there because of the use of drugs between their lips. Illicit ones or excessive use of legal ones. Even the painkillers have their problems when used indiscreetly. One in every ten is there because of alcohol. About another five is there because of our excessive use of animal products. Now this book doesn't say you've got to be a vegetarian does teach clearly God's original plan for man was vegetarianism. And the nearer you can get to it, the less pain in this life for most of us. So, as I look at the cross of Christ, and I see him reject that which taken through the lips would have brought him comfort and ease, I say, hey, becoming a Christian means discipline. And because in this country, in almost any congregation half will die of heart disease and one in every four, one quarter, will die of cancer. And because for the most part these are both unnecessary, I say what I say. 
Now you can be as dedicated as you, as you please under the grace of God and be hit by a truck. You can be as dedicated as you please and if you've got a bad genetic hand-me-down, you may die at 40. But Christians have to play by the rules even of Reno. What do I mean? At Reno they stack things so that most of the time the house is winning. It doesn't mean no one's going, not going to go away rich. Some people go away rich. Not for long, keeps bringing them back. You never win as a gambler. Every time you win, it just, just delays the day when you lose it. You can never win if you're a gambler. But they have so slanted the odds that most of the time the odds are in favour of the house. The Christian has to live by that rule. You cannot guarantee by a disciplined life you're going to live longer or even better. But you've got to slant the odds. It's your duty to slant the odds. We belong to God. I'll tell you something personally. I'd have been dead or useless decades ago but for this truth. I was beginning to fall apart in my 20s and a Christian doctor said to me, you'll be finished by 40. You'll be finished by 40. And I was much more fussy than most people but not fussy enough for someone with my type of temperament. So I'm trying to make the gospel very practical. I know that if this is a typical congregation, many among us will have unnecessary pain, unnecessary sorrow, because we haven't learnt the lesson here at the cross, that being a Christian does mean discipline. It doesn't mean a puritanical aversion to joy. God created appetite, not the devil. God made flavours. The devil could make a peach or a strawberry. It doesn't mean that. It means the right use of God's gifts. Now let's look at one other thing. This is the last one we look at. It says in verse 47, some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man's calling Elijah. And one of them, it was a soldier according to one of the other gospels, if I remember I think, one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with vinegar, put on a reed and gave to him to drink. One of them, one of them. Many heard the cry. They also heard him cry, I thirst. Most of them ignored it. But one of them is touched. One young soldier says, well, I can't get him off the cross, but I'll do what I can. And so he takes hyssop, a little tiny spring, dips it in the vinegar, and lifts it up to the Saviour. One day, that young soldier will see the same face again. One day that young soldier will see Christ coming in the clouds of heaven, drawing ever nearer. And you'll say, why? That's the one to whom I gave something to drink. Isn't the supreme meaning of the cross in its practical outworking right at this point? The cross should make us kind. The cross should make us gentle. The cross should make us great givers and great forgivers. We are to remember that inasmuch as we do it under one of the least of these, we do it under him. What a privilege. We meet with Jesus every day. Every time we meet someone, we greet our spouse and we get up in the morning, Jesus. Meet the postman, Jesus. Person of the store, Jesus. Inasmuch as you do it under the least of these, you do it under me. I never tire of thinking of Mother Teresa's recipe for heaven. Don't wait for heaven, she says. You can have heaven today. If you will treat every person as though they're Jesus, you'll have heaven today. Because once you've got a heart like that, my friends, anger's gone, passion's gone, pride is gone. To love is to be in paradise. If you and I fully receive the Christ of the cross and anew every day because the tide of the world washes over us every day and we become tired and we get hurt, we are wounded. But if we will receive him every day, as surely as the sun rises, let the sun of righteousness rise in our hearts every day, he'll give us that love. He'll turn life into paradise. Those that find the cross of Christ and the Christ of the cross find the tree of life and they're back in the paradise of God.
Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the gospel. Help us to see it at its heart, in its essence, as a revelation of your great heart of love and mercy, tenderness and pity, infinitely kind, infinitely good, forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin, showing mercy under thousands of generations of those that love you and keep your commandments. Grant that in seeing thee we may be changed. And this changing may take place afresh every day in our pilgrimage till we can learn in our measure to love after your pattern, to love even the unlovely. Do it for us, for we cannot do it for ourselves. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Before you go, I must tell you something I was saying to Jill over and over this morning. How does it go? There all will meet, one and all, rich and poor, one and all, and poor I will shake hands with the blessed Saint Paul. Isn't that a great prospect? One day we will all meet, one and all, and poor I will shake hands with the blessed Saint Paul. So we say unto you, we'll see you here, there, or in the air, and God go with you.